The title of my sermon for this Easter Sunday morning is The Same Spirit with the Same Power. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I'm going to tell you what the gospel is. But then beyond that, we're going to be all over the scripture. So do your best to follow along on the screen. I have them all up there, at least what I could remember of all of my uh, verses. And we're going to kind of track this morning. We're going to, hopefully you can track with me on the same train track and we get to the same destination. Today, as has been mentioned, we celebrate life. We celebrate not just life, but life from the dead. And not just temporary life from the dead, but resurrection, life eternal. Power. We celebrate power that none of us can even comprehend. Yeah. We can't even scratch the surface of what took place Amen. on that Easter morning. And we also celebrate a hope far beyond what words can express. Far beyond what our hearts can even begin to process. A hope for a bright and glorious future. And not just a hope and a bright future for tomorrow, but all through eternity. That's what we celebrate today. So this morning, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Perhaps an odd place to begin an Easter message. You usually expect closer to the end of John or the end of Matthew, but... Today, Paul gives us a message that's all-encompassing. He says, this is the gospel. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel. By the way, the gospel, we often get the idea and the very shallow definition of what the gospel is as the good news. Oh, it's good news. Don't get me wrong. But there is so much more to that than this. I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received in which you stand, by which you are saved, if you hold fast that which I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. Heaven forbid. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. And he was seen by Cephas, or Peter, then by the twelve. After that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part now remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, Jesus' half-brother, and all of the apostles, then at last... Last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. Here's the gospel. This, if, if any of these fail to hold the test of time, if they are proven false, all of religion, all of Christian religion collapses immediately. We are to be more pitied than all men if these fail. This is what Paul says. This is the foundation on our faith that Christ died for our sins. Amen? Right. If He didn't die for your sins, guess what? You're still in them and there's no hope for your salvation. Right. He died for our sins. He was buried. Hey, if He wasn't dead, there's no payment for sin. Right. He could shed His blood, but I've shed my blood a few times for the church too. It's not good enough. No, the sacrificial lamb had to die. So he was buried. But he wasn't just buried. On the third day, he rose again. He is what? This is what separates us from all other religions of the world because the God that we serve is living and powerful. He's not dead in the grave. But then notice, it also mentions two times that He rose again 
and that he died for our sins according to the Scriptures. This is not something that just happened. This was written thousands of years in advance, even as early as Genesis chapter 3, talking about what Jesus would do. Without those prophecies, our relationship with God crushes to a fault. It's a failure. It's empty. But he fulfilled all the scriptures down to the dot and the tittle, the jot and the tittle. And last of all, he was seen by Peter, by the twelve, over 500 at one time, Jesus' half-brother James, all of the apostles, and even the writer here testifies that, yes, I even saw Jesus as if out of time on the Damascus Road. And then he was actually trained by Jesus for three years. And we've been going through that shameless plug in the book of Acts. <laughs> if any of these. If nobody saw Jesus after his resurrection, did he really? But when, the, when this took place, when the Gospels were written, even when Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians, there were still those that were alive that they could go and ask, did you really see, I mean, were you, out of, what did you have been drinking that day? <laughs> did you have a little bad food and it messed you up and you were starting to see visions? Were all of you out of body, out of mind? Or did you really see him? To which Thomas would say, oh buddy, I didn't just see him. He told me to take my finger and put it in his side. He told me to take my finger and put it in the nail prints of his hands. I watched him before my very eyes cook food for us on the shore of Galilee. I watched him eat the food, not like some ghost. Oh, no, no, no. He's real and living. And it wasn't just one or two. <laughs> Over 500 at one time. It's pretty hard to deceive that many. And as I'm sure you've heard in this time period, there might be a few that would be willing to die for a lie. But not all these people. And to die in some of the most horrific fashions the world has ever known. They could say nothing else than what Polycarp said. <laughs> I've served him 86 years. And he's always been good to me, and I'm not going to betray him now. This is the foundation of our faith. If we go a little further in the chapter, verse 13, Paul says this, But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Yes, we are found false... And we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He did not raise up, if in fact He did not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life we only have... In this life only we have hope in Christ. We are of all men most pitiable. But he doesn't end it there, does he? Verse 20. But now! Christ is risen from the dead. And has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now we don't use that term first fruits anymore. But his writers would have understood it well. To have the first fruit sacrifice, what they would do right before harvest would come in, they would go out and they would gather the first part of the harvest and they would tie it up in a bundle and then they would take it into the temple and they would give it to God. And it was a, it was a thank you God for being faithful. Thank you for giving me this blessing and now I give it back to you. It's thanking God not only for His faithfulness in the present, but His bountiful harvest in the future. Because it was a hope that if I have this much now and I give it to God, when I come to the full harvest, 
When everything's said and done, this whole field's going to be full and he's going to provide all of my needs. And so I'm thanking him now. I'm giving it to him now. So how is Jesus our first fruits? Well, you see, when Jesus was raised first, that gives the promise and the hope, just like the harvest of the field, that there are going to be countless, many more, that will be raised with him, not just for a moment in time, not just like Lazarus who <laughs> immediately after they raised him from the as Jesus raised him from the dead, they wanted to kill him again. No, 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 no. Raised to life eternal. Eternal life that all of us can receive because Jesus is risen. So why Jesus? What's so special about this guy than any of the rest of us? Why didn't God raise Mother Teresa to eternal life for our sins? Why Jesus? Well, first of all, He alone is worthy. Oh, <laughs> Sorry, Jonathan, I just realized Daniel's got it. Next week. Jonathan asked me a question and I meant to, and I told him yes and then I forgot. Why raise Jesus? Jesus alone is worthy. In Revelation chapter 5, there's a beautiful story. John is up in heaven. The, the apostle John is up in heaven. And he sees this scroll that's brought out. It has seven seals on it. What it is, it's the title deed for earth. And what they would do is they would write on the inside what you would receive. And on the outside, they would write what you have to do to get the inside. And only the one that has done what's on the outside is allowed to break the wax seal and open it up and get what's on the inside. And there's actually in that passage, there's seven. Well, unfortunately in the story, John, as he's watching this, the request is given, who is worthy to open the title deed to heaven? I mean, to earth. Who's worthy? And there was absolute silence. It's not given, but I kind of wonder if the whole world and all humanity was being scanned at that time. And the more it took place, the more John realized how sinful and unworthy humanity is, including himself, that no one could open this title deed and receive earth. And just as he's weeping, convuls convulsing and weeping uncontrollably, he turns and he sees Jesus as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And he alone is found worthy. And this is what it says. And they sang a new song as he came to open the scroll. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on earth. He is worthy alone. Because He alone redeemed us. Further than that, He alone is holy out of humanity. Psalm 16, verse 10. This is a prophecy of Jesus. It says, You will not leave my soul in Sheol or hell, nor will you allow your holy two to see corruption. Your holy three. No, 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 no. Your holy one. Not only is He worthy... He is also holy, and He is also sinless. I have a real problem with that word, apparently. Because every time I go to do a Bible study on it, and saying sinless, I say sinful. So I'm making sure you all know right now, Jesus had no sin. And I'll say it right, so I don't have to edit it out of a video when I messed it up. I've done that twice now. It's a running joke. Jesus had no sin. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest that cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, 
but in all points was tempted as we are, yet without sin. So the reason Jesus was raised was because he's worthy, he was holy, and he was sinless. This is why he came to earth. John chapter 3, verse 8. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy, not fix, not heal, not mend, destroy the works of the devil. Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. Jesus, in his very first sermon, he goes and he, un, he goes to the book of Isaiah, unrolls it until he gets to Isaiah 61, and this is what he says of himself. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to recover sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And He sat down and He said, Today <laughs> it's fulfilled in your hearing. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> Capernaum got the first message. He came to destroy the works of the devil. Everything evil and broken in this world is a result of sin and the deception by the devil. Jesus came to set all things right and to destroy the things that were wrong in this world. All deception and all spiritual blindness, He came to destroy. Addiction and sinfulness, He came to destroy. All pain, hurt, bitterness, unforgiveness. He came to destroy them all. He came to right all the wrongs and to tell us that He will universally do it one day, but individually do it today. One day it's all going to be fixed. All around the world, everything's going to be done. He's going to show back up. There won't be anybody oppose Him that's going to last. He's going to make it happen. He's going to destroy the works of the enemy all across the world. But you know what? That wouldn't be good enough for you and me today because we might not be there when it happens. So He came that individually those things could be taken care of, destroyed in us today. In Him alone is resurrection and life. There is no one else that has been dead and raised to life eternal that could pay for our sins, that was worthy, that was holy, that was sinless. Revelation chapter 2, verse 8, if you were here when, uh, Friday night, these things says the first and the last was dead and came to life. He has the power over death itself. Our number one enemy that we can't fix, we can't defeat, He did. He has the power not only over death, but He has the power to give life. John chapter 1, verse 25-26, through 26, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in Me, though he may die, shall live. And whoever lives in and believes in Me shall never die. And then He asks the wonderful question, do you believe this? Do you believe it? That He can give you life? That He can conquer death in your life? That if you believe in Him, you can have eternal life? Do you believe it? Amen. I, this passage, John chapter 20, verse 22, Jesus, after His resurrection, shows up to the disciples in the room. And He does the weirdest thing ever. Verse 22, it says, And when He said this, He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. I don't know how many times I've read through that and thought it was funny and, and laughed at it. And all I can picture in my mind is Jesus going, <sighs> Receive the Spirit. And then I wonder in my mind, Okay, did He brush that morning? <laughs> right? This is a little odd. Until the Holy Spirit gave me the connection from Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living being. Jesus, the Word, was with God and was God, and nothing was made without him. John chapter 1. 
Not only did He breathe into us physical life, He breathes into us spiritual life as well. Only He has the power to do that. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8 through 11. Paul says this, Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellency, excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ, and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, trying to do the good works, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to His death, if by any means I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. Paul says, and I want the same thing he wants in this passage. Oh, it's a burning passion in my heart. I don't want anything in my life that would make me miss Christ. Amen. Nothing! There is nothing in all of this world that is worth missing a relationship with my Savior. All of the short-term enjoyments of sin... They're not worth it. Yeah, they may be a pleasure, but they leave a rot in your mouth afterwards. A burden on your soul that you can't wipe away. To have Him as my Savior and to have a relationship with Him is worth all the world. I want to know Him more. He gave me life from spiritual death. There's only a few in this room that know exactly what I'm talking about. One of my best friends and my sister sitting over there, they knew me long before you all did. He gave me life. He gave me life out of dead addiction. He gave me life in my bitterness. He gave me life in my brokenness and my sadness. He gave me life in my fear and my anxieties. What God has done in me is more than I could have ever imagined when I accepted Him as my Savior. But you know what? He's not done with me. There are greater things in this life for my spiritual life than what I have today. And I want more. I want to be more alive. I want to be more free. I want to be more on fire for Him than I ever have. I want to know in a greater way the power of His resurrection in my life. There was a lot of dead he couldn't heal it. He couldn't fix it. So you know what he did? He ripped it out and he planted new. I want greater life in my brokenness. I want greater life in the hurts. I want greater life to the blindness that I have about who he is in his word. There's more to be had. Not just in knowledge of book learning. This is not just opening a book and memorizing facts and figures. This is knowing Him personally by experience. Paul says, I want to know Him through experience like you can receive nowhere else. Not only do I want to know Him that way, I want you to know Him that way too. I give a lot of facts and figures in my sermon. And I try to treat, preach all the way across the Bible every sermon. But that's not good enough. I want you to know Him as your Savior. 
I want you to know him from raising you to de from dead to life. I want you to experience what it is to have a relationship with your Savior. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. Paul says this to the church at Ephesus. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Church, do you know that I pray for you constantly to receive this knowledge? I want you to have it not in mental, in heart. I don't want it in facts and figures. I want it by experience. I pray that God, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. That the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. And since we're on Easter, I pray, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power towards us who believe, according to the working of His mighty power, which He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at the right hand of heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. I want you to know the power that is living in you. I want you to know that the power that's living in you is the same power that took Jesus from a third day in the grave to life everlasting. To see Him on above all principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that's named. That's the power of the Spirit. And guess what? That same power is in you. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. The Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. He says it's not just a spiritual thing, some metaphysical way out there. No, it's life right here and now for eternity. The same Spirit that raised Jesus in all of His power to life lives in you. If the Holy Spirit has the power to raise the physically dead to physical and spiritual life, what, God can, what can God not do in you, in through you, and for you? Is there anything? Is there anything too hard for God we preached on about a month ago? Is that really what it says up there? That the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is in us? That's inside you, not just momentarily, but makes its dwelling. That's his address. That's where he gets mail. <laughs> it's from inside you. Jesus said, <laughs> with God, all things are possible. If that same spirit's in you, all things are possible. Guess what? For you, there's no power. There's no sin. There's no destruction. There's no addiction. That's too powerful for him. If he could bring everything from dead to life, he can certainly take care of the problem that you have in your inside. Let's face it. How many of you, after buying a house, clean out all of the house, move your stuff in, put the pictures on the wall, and then leave one corner room that's just filled with junk and trash? Leftover food so the rats can get it. Not a chance. <laughs> no, you buy the house, it's yours. So you're going to go through that house, especially if you're like my wife, and clean that thing till you can eat off the floors, the walls, and the toilet seat. <laughs> because it's yours. Jesus' Spirit came in. And He's not satisfied to leave the junk on the wall, to leave the dishes in the sink. No, He's cleaning it all. There is nothing that he can't wipe out. If there's structural problems, guess what? He'll tear the sheetrock down and reframe the walls. There's nothing that he can't do in you because the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. Are you struggling? 
Are you heartbroken? Are you dealing with hang-ups? Do you feel like you're drowning? Are you trapped by fear and anxiety? He has life over all of those things. All of those things are a result of the fall, and He promised that He came to destroy the works of the devil. All of them. So all of those things that are in there, He can deal with. And He can deal with it for you. Not just for somebody down the street, not a Mother Teresa, as some kind of saint. No, He does it for you. But is that really what it says? I actually prayed, played a trick on you. Because I left a few words out. It didn't just say the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. No, it actually said a little bit more than that. <laughs> Something a little more personal. Verse 8 says, And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Do you get the point of the if? See, there's a question there. It's possible. The invitation is open. But guess what? That doesn't mean you might have. Uh, my kids, number one, number one rule for my house and my family, they tell every visitor that comes to our house, anytime you come to eat a meal, if you leave my house hungry, it's your own fault. Because I've got food that will make food if you don't like the food we got. There's food on the table, and there's more than enough. And if there's not, guess what? We'll throw some more eggs on the fire. We'll throw a few steaks from the freezer. We'll heat them up real quick. We'll season them fast. They may not taste as great, but if you're hungry, you can be fed. The invitation is wide open if you come into my house. You're in Jesus' house today and He says, you know what? The invitation is wide open. And if you want those things destroyed in your life, if you want victory over them, it's not anything that you can do, but it's what I've already done because I have the power over death. I have life in my hands and I can give it to who I please. And the invitation is open, so if you want it, you can come get it. And if you leave hungry, it's your own fault. He has the power for all the works of the devil. This life is for you. Or, better maybe said, it can be yours if you accept it. Not just once, when you prayed a long time ago. No, no, no. This victory is for today. It's also for tomorrow. Because you know what? Tomorrow's included in eternity. He's not done with you yet, and He's got better things for you yet, if you'll just accept it. If you'll let Him do it. In what ways do you need your life to have life? There's no one excluded because there's no limit to His power or His invitation. Are you holding unforgiveness? Do you have questions and doubts about God? Do you have sin that you keep falling to? I don't know your issue. I don't know your circumstance. But whatever it might be, guess what? He's got power all-inclusively to take care of your need. There is life to be had for whatever your need may be because the same Spirit the same power that raised Jesus from dead to life is alive in you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. It really does mean the world to me that you're getting a blessing out of it. If this video was a blessing, make sure to hit that thumbs up button for me. That way other people can find it as well. Here in the link section, you'll find playlists and new videos that we put out. We try to do two or three a week. You can also subscribe to the channel. Uh, by pressing on my face and then hitting the bell icon, and that will alert you to new videos. May God richly bless you.